αρχίζει η συνεδρία. Εκλεκτή προσκεκλημένη. Είναι ιδιαίτερη τιμή για μένα να καλωσορίζω απόψε στην εκδήλωση μνήμη για την επέτειο τη γενοκτονία των Αρμενίων. Όλου σα. Conference in honor of the genocide against the Armenians, a, which is co-hosted by the Academy of Athens and uh, the Armenian Embassy in uh, Athens, Greece, talking uh, about this uh, uh, and this uh, effort of the Ottoman Empire to completely eliminate uh, the Armenian people. We had the pleasure of having with us yesterday the president of the Academy of Sciences of the Armenian, uh, Re Armenian Republic, Mr. Asot Sayan, who accepted the invitation of the Academy of Athens. He traveled from Yerevan and honored us with his presence in order to sign a memorandum of cooperation that was drafted by the Academy of Athens and the Academy of Sciences of the Armenian Republic. The memorandum was signed yesterday here in the Academy of Athens with the aim of reinforcing the bonds of friendship between the two academies, but also the meaningful promotion of synergies at different levels, especially at the level of research. We are particularly glad for this development and we aspire to reach a fruitful cooperation. Unfortunately, President Sayan had to return to Yerevan earlier than scheduled. The genocide of the Armenians of 1915 constitutes a sad moment of the global history and is considered to be a premeditated and systemic campaign for the elimination of an entire people. Greece was one of the first countries that uh, recognized the genocide of uh, Armenians as a brutal crime against humanity. Our country has also experienced at different stages of its history, persecution, subjugation and loss, and of course is on the side of the Armenian people who, despite uh, the atrocious uh, blows that it suffered, uh, did not surrender, but survived and continued to shape its history and to create civilization and culture. It is a duty of all of us uh, to preserve the memory of these events, not only as an honor to the memory of uh, the victims, but also as a promise that we will continue to fight uh, each and every one uh, when and from where we can in order to eliminate uh, the possibility of similar events taking place in, in the future. At this point, I would like to thank the extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the Armenian Republic in the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Tigran Makchan, who is uh, here on the panel, for his proposal to co-organize this event. And I would also like to thank him for the books he offered to us of historical content, books that focus on the genocide of the Armenians that go, that you can see at the back and uh, that will be presented uh, later by the second speaker. In conclusion, I would like to highlight the great importance of this event for the Academy of Athens, since by paying tribute to the victims of the genocide of the Armenians, we want to convey at the same time a message for the importance of defending the fundamental human rights for the necessary resistance uh, to the rhetoric of hatred that we actually witness uh, today in the two wars that are in that are in development, not only in those. And we, as Academy, we want to contribute to the public dialogue uh, that promotes respect of other cultures and the dedication to the objective of a peaceful coexistence of peoples. 
Thank you very much for your attention. And at this point, I would also like to tell you that at the end of the event, and with the contribution of the museologist, Ms. Sekaravidaki, you will have the possibility in the margins of this event uh, to visit the Eastern Room of the Academy, an exhibition with the uh, artifacts and exhibits of Armenian artists uh, that uh, have lived or currently live in uh, Greece. Uh, so after the completion of this event, you are all invited to visit this uh, exhibition, which is a small uh, example of the Armenian artistic uh, life. I would also like uh, to thank in particular the former president of the parliament, Ms. Anna Benaki, who is a well-known fighter of uh, the protection of fundamental human rights. Thank you very much for being here with us. First, I would like to give the floor to the representative of the government, Mr. Ioannis Chrysoulakis. Mr. Chrysoulakis, if you like, please come to the podium to address the event. Your Excellency, former Hellenic Republic presidents, Your Excellency, uh, Chair of the uh, Armenian Republic, distinguished members of the Academy of Athens, distinguished attendants. It is a particular honor for me to be with you here today as a representative of the Hellenic government in the event for the Memory Day of the Genocide uh, of the Armenians by the Turks in 1915. Ladies and gentlemen, Greek and Armenian people are connected between them since antiquity until now with a connection that is deep and intrinsic under similar uh, religious, cultural, and social and geopolitical conditions these people coexisted. They coexisted throughout the centuries uh, uh, with the strongest connection. A joint fate has united us emotionally and historically as friends and brothers. We're two peoples that carry in their historical cell the wound of genocide that hasn't healed, genocide that was perpetrated by the same hand. Armenian genocide, the first genocide of the modern world, is one of the darkest pages of world history. And it is an unpunished crime against humanity. We honor and memorize the countless victims, displacements, torture, and slaughters. Your reverence, representatives, Represent your reverence of our Archbishop, ladies and gentlemen, as humanity and as civilized nations, we ought to aim to raising awareness of all on the issue of historical and moral justification of our genocided ancestors. We ought to continue to fight for the recognition from the entirety of um, human community. We ought to uh, say, no, this must never happen again. This is our duty to deal with this challenge, always thinking about uh, human liberties and justice and with a view to the next generation, with a vision of a world of peaceful coexistence, a better world. As Greeks, friends, and brothers, we are and will continue to be with you in memoriam and in your struggle. Thank you very much. And now the floor to 
the ambassador of uh, uh, the Republic of the of Romania to the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Tizan Mesercian. President Pablo Pulos, spiritual fathers, honorable representative of the Greek government, Mr. Chrysoulakis, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, ambassadors, thank you all for coming here and honoring the memory, the 109th anniversary of the memory of the Armenian genocide. I want to specifically thank the Academy of Athens for hosting this event today with us, co-hosting this event. And I would like to um, emphasize my special gratitude to President Pavlopoulos because uh, about a year and a half ago when I met him, we discussed initially that there is a need to organize a nice academic event dedicated to the anniversary of the Armenian genocide which is happening now. I would also like to thank uh, the president, the current president of the Academy of Science, uh, Stamatios Kremigis, unfortunately, who could not join today here, uh, as well as the previous president and the chair of this uh, meeting today, um, Michalis Stathopoulos with whom uh, last year we discussed the idea of organizing this event and with whom we also discussed the possibility of uh, coordinating an agreement, official agreement between the Academy of Sciences of Armenia and the Academy of Athens, which happened yesterday, an historic event, of course, for which we are very happy because uh, we're talking about genocide today, but, um, as nations which, uh, which have survived massacres and genocides, we Armenians and Greeks uh, have to move forward, have to get stronger and have to cooperate as much as possible and have to progress as well. So today we uh, invited also Mr. Arakedipian to talk about his work, lifelong work, of uh, publishing several volumes of the US media coverage of the Armenian genocide. But also you may get acquainted with the books which are presented here, which are shown here on display. Um, presenting also some other topics, including, including the Greek uh, Pontic genocide, a volume, another volume on the Assyrian genocide. Also the orphans of the uh, genocide, forced conversions, just a few days ago, Adana Massacre's coverage of the US media was published in Yerevan, and we are happy to be the first to actually present the book here now. Um, so all of this work will be presented by uh, Mr. Kedipian in more detail when he talks. Uh, I should also here like to remember my mentor in, in the foreign ministry, and ambassador, former ambassador of Armenia to Greece, um, His Excellency Arman Kirakosian, who had published one volume in 2004 on the US media coverage of the Armenian massacres of 1894-96, which uh, included 35 articles by leading journalists and activists from the United Missionaries from the United States. Uh, but the work uh, done here and completed, which is in progress actually uh, by uh, Mr. Kedipian is an all encompassing uh, work which uh, would befit an entire institution to complete. And we're proud to present this work here as a, a paying tribute to the victims of the genocide. Uh, we may say a lot about the Armenian genocide on these days since April 21st when the um, Armenian national prelacy and the Armenian community started the commemoration here. Much has been already said and I 
don't want to repeat uh, some of the history that happened to us 109 years ago. But uh, we should emphasize a few things for the, for the record, that this was a crime against humanity and civilization, and it was confirmed by the great powers 19 in 1915 on May 24th statement, which, uh, which was actually uh, in the process of the genocide, which was continuing. It had started earlier and it continued for a few more years. And yet not sufficient, the international mechanisms to prevent its escalation and to stop it did not prove effective, unfortunately. And unfortunately, as we see now, as we saw in 2020 in Artsakh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, and also in 2021 against Armenia, in 2022 against Armenia, in 2023 against Nagorno-Karabakh again. These mechanisms haven't been proven effective, and we have time and again seen application of double standards in the international affairs. Uh, but of course, we cannot give up on this, and we have to use all means possible to make our nations resilient and withstand any possible future attempts at our annihilation. So what can the state of Armenia or the Republic of Armenia do? Of course, one and foremost uh, is the uh, intensification of the Armenian security environment or diversification of the Armenian security environment, uh, cooperating and trying to find reliable friends and allies. And one of them, of course, is Greece. And I'm happy to say that in terms of cooperation with Greece, including on defense uh, sector, uh, we are registering certain successes. And this is extremely important to understand. So this is uh, this is one of the things that we should and we do uh, in terms of uh, making Armenia more uh, as much secure as possible. I mean, in nowadays world, it's it's never enough uh, to have security. But when you are surrounded by neighbors which are day and night propagating prop propagating about your um, about your annihilation, uh, sometimes you feel also some pride in acts committed in the past, this is becoming extremely worrying, of course. Uh, one of the features of the Armenian genocide, which happened also during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, was the ingrained denial right from the beginning when the crime was being committed on those days, in during the process of the acts of barbarities which were committed against the Armenians, there was an ongoing in parallel process by the official uh, port at that time um, to deny what was happening. When proven wrong about denial, there was the second uh, sort of layer of, uh, of justification that there were provocations in this or that city and the um, and the Muslim population or Turkish population had to react. So that was like justification of genocide. And also the third uh, uh, layer of this entire process is the pride. When uh, everything was completed, uh, several officials in Turkey, in modern day Turkey, they feel proud about what has happened. Uh, because I cannot understand, I think nobody present here can understand the logic of glorifying people like Enver Pasha or Talat Pasha in modern day Turkey. It's impossible to understand. It would be the same if uh, one glorifies Hitler or um, Göring in today's Germany. It's impossible to imagine, but this is happening. And this is happening because of the lack of uh, punishment, because of the impunity of the genocide. And here is the second and the last part of my talk, I'm coming to uh, what Armenia can do to prevent this. I, I mentioned first about Armenia being strong or becoming strong 
making a strong state, democratic institutions, etc. Second, of course, is uh, our struggle in the international arena, together with our partners, in further um, fortifying or strengthening the legal mechanisms about prevention of genocide. And uh, Armenia has been on the forefront of um, presenting resolutions in the United Nations Human Rights Council, the last of which was done just 23 days ago on April 23rd. Uh, this time it's again called uh, Resolution on the Genocide Prevention. Uh, the specific emphasis on this resolution is put on the early warning of the crime of genocide. Early warning because before the genocide happens, there is an envi genocidal environment which is created. And when there is no reaction to prevent the escalation, this environment is leading to the crime of genocide. The environment in the Ottoman Turkey existed well before 1915. I mean, it had been starting from 1890s. The environment in Nagorno-Karabakh existed several years before the conflict erupted in 90s. And in 2023, before the final ethnic cleansing in Nagorno-Karabakh, there was nine months blockade, blockade against the population of Artsakh. Nine months of blockade, blockade to starve, eventually to bomb and to expel the people from their fatherland. And despite all of our warnings and alarming calls on all levels, the international society proved unable to prevent this crime happening. And currently we see that the state of Azerbaijan is doing everything to exclude the return of the people to their fatherland. Not only destroying their homes and property, but also destroying or turning their churches into something else, or distorting the essence of the churches, Christian churches of the Armenians, claiming that these are not Armenian churches, there were no Armenians here, and the Armenians are newcomers from here, for, uh, to here. So the resolution I mentioned is uh, emphasizing the fact of the early warning, and the and it is uh, explaining the toolkits that are needed to, to make it more effective, the early warning mechanisms. And to that end, um, at the end of this year, in December, the Republic of Armenia is hosting uh, the fifth global forum against the crime of genocide. Uh, with this emphasis added, and we will invite, we are inviting scholars and academicians from all around the world to take part in this event. This will be the fifth event. I'm proud to say that during the first to third event, I was one of the co-organizers and, and, um, and participants of this event. But now I'm here and uh, in Greece as an ambassador and my job is uh, a little bit of a different nature. So once again, I want to thank you all for being here. And at the end, last but not least, I would like to uh, end this uh, address in a positive light. Uh, Mr. Statopoulos mentioned about the uh, exhibition. I think the exhibition shown here, which is, which presents a few of the paintings of the Greek Armenians, um, is not just uh, you know paintings presenting the works of Greek Armenians. It is a symbol of the survival of the generation of the genocide. That the genocide, after all, did not succeed. The Armenians are alive. The Armenians are creating. The Armenians will always create and make all those places wherever they live, good societies, better societies, more cultural societies. So the paintings here symbolize, in fact, this uh, resilience, this nature of survival, and uh, are in a way a token of this um, survivor generation. 
So once again, thank you. Thanks to the Academy for hosting with us this event. And thank you all for being with us to honor the memory of the innocent victims who are for us uh, declared by our church as saints. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the ambassador for his address that actually turned into an inspired speech. And now, we will hear the speech of the Prokopis Pavlopoulos, former president of the Hellenic Republic. He will pay tribute to the victims. He will talk about the recognition of the genocide of the Armenians by our country as a crime against humanity, and uh, will set uh, the historical documented uh, trajectory of the genocide, and will also highlight the importance of preventing similar events in the future. Mr. Pavlopoulos, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Reverence. Your Reverence of the Armenian Church here in Athens, uh, Mr. General Secretary of the Diaspora in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, ladies and gentlemen, academics, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, on behalf of the Academy of Athens, and with uh, deep emotion, respect, but also devastation, a true emotional devastation. I would like to pay tribute to the memory of one million and a half victims of the Turkish brutality that constituted the big, the first black page of uh, the 19th of the 20th century. And of course, I'm talking about the genocide of the Armenians. The Academy of Athens, especially during the last few years, has taken a different orientation, has adopted a different mentality with regard to the world we live in and to the link between the world of sciences and the real life, not only in Greece, not only in the European family, but also globally. The Academy of Athens is the guardian of all those teachings that uh, we need to keep alive in these uh, difficult times because as a foundation that serves the spirit and sciences has a duty to preserve fully these bastions uh, that will allow us to defend uh, humanity, democracy, freedom. In this context, today, we can uh, say that uh, we are seeing the initiation of an effort uh, started by Mr. Stathopoulos uh, through the organization of this event, one more April. April 2024, 109 years after the greatest tragedy and the greatest crime. And we organized this event uh, as representatives of uh, the Greek people and the Greek spirit, the Greek civilization, as people that is always on the side of the Armenian people in these uh, difficult times so that they can together impose as they should, but also defend, but also in action and in practice, the principle of never again. This is the reason why I'm here today. In order to explain to you how we perceive this never again as Greeks, and how important it is to realize that never again has not an anniversary dimension. Times tend to repeat themselves. These difficult times, uh, the time that we are going through today, should be prevailed by never again. For us, the Greeks, 
it is even more important because our people say have led uh, parallel lives. It's not important to talk about the number of the victims. The genocides were genocides. And so the impressive fact is that these two people say actually experienced the genocide at the same time, the second decade of the 20th century. The Armenians experienced this uh, crime against humanity, and we, the Greeks, uh, two successive genocides, the genocide of the Greeks of Pontus and the genocide of the Greeks of uh, Asia Minor. That's why we're always uh, sensitive uh, to these issues, and uh, we never forget that we are one of the first states that in 1996 already, with law 2397 of 1996, I repeat, uh, officially recognized the genocide of the Armenians as a crime against humanity. What do I want to say, Mr. Ambassador? Something you already know. What I want to say is that it, this was not a law of the government. Just like Mr. Thathopoulos, Ms. Benaki, and myself as uh, legals uh, know, was one of the very few laws, so we have 86,000 laws, uh, mind you, that, uh, that was a law that was the result of a proposal made by the Hellenic Parliament itself. Not by the government. It was not a governmental plan. It was the entire Hellenic parliament that made this proposal because it represented the entire Greek people in its uh, proposal to recognize the genocide of the Armenians. And then, shortly afterwards, the parliament repeated its uh, intention and desire to respect never again by expressing the provisions of law 4285 of 2014 on the criminalization of those who deny the Holocaust and the genocides, among which the genocide of the Armenians and of the Greeks of Pontus and Asia Minor. And I remember it was my last year as an MP, and I, I, I truly I remember with great emotion back in 2014 that this uh, article of that law was an article that I personally drafted back then. And then I experienced something similar when I was uh, president of the Hellenic Republic. So we, the Greeks, have always been on the side of the Armenian people, and we have always uh, fought together. And the Armenian uh, parliament, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the few parliaments that has officially recognized the genocide of the Greeks of Pontus. Because Mr. Ambassador, just like you, have managed to ensure the universal recognition of the genocide of the Armenians so with uh, the acknowledgement also by the American, we haven't reached that point. We follow your example, we follow your path, and we are going to expand our efforts, not because uh, those who died uh, scream for it, but because we don't want this genocide to be forgotten. Because uh, when uh, these genocides, when teachings are forgotten, then uh, only bitter results uh, come about. So how do we perceive we, the Greeks, and the Armenians, uh, never again? It is simple. Never again means not only that every year we need to honor the anniversary, but at the same time to find the traces of history or, and of these uh, atrocities and try to find similar signs in the pres present so as to be ready to say something else, something different, something uh, that emerged during the Spanish Civil War, to be able to say to the those who want to, con to perpetrate a genocide, no pasaran. We must be prepared to say that. 
Of course, the Armenian colleague will take the floor later and he will repeat that. But I would also like to say that the Armenian people has always been a creative Christian people that has lived uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Turkey, a smart, ingenious people that uh, has uh, worked with the Greek people several different times and in several different ways. But this people is at the same time a people that uh, never makes any settlements with regards to this freedom, always claims its freedom. And mind you, we're talking about uh, the 19th century yet and the 20th century. And while the Ottoman Empire was not uh, oppressive, uh, things uh, for the Armenians and uh, the Greeks uh, were rather easier. They were allowed to create and to live without major obstacles. But things started to change when the signs of the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire became evident. After 1880, that is, when there was still the Sultan. And it was then that the first persecution started against the Armenians who were trying to ensure what? Respect of the freedom and the establishment of a organization that would allow for self-governance. And it was then that the Turkish atrocity started taking place. And we should not forget that uh, in the two years between 1894 and 1896, we had 300,000 slaughters and executions. It was then that the young Turks that were undermining as much as they could the state of the Sultan, that is the Ottoman Empire, they had almost uh, approached Armenians and Greeks, uh, telling them, support us so that we can overthrow the Sultan and we will be on your side. Then, as time went by, as a state, uh, we will support you in the context of a multicultural and multinational Turkey. Something that actually happened. And then the communities uh, were in difficult times because uh, slaughtering, slaughters had already started, but still these communities decided to support the young Turks, uh, hoping that uh, justice will prevail. And this was the greatest illusion because history proved immediately after the young Turks uh, took power that uh, not only they had no intention of uh, supporting these people, not only they had uh, no democratic uh, awareness, but the only thing they were interested in was to overthrow the Sultan and establish uh, a state that would defend the Ottoman Empire. Don't forget that this is actually the desire of current and contemporary Turks, and this is actually the intention that uh, is latent in the modern Turkish policy. Things haven't changed. We shouldn't have these illusions. So that's why at that time, immediately after they took power, they started the persecutions, uh, first and foremost, uh, of the Armenians. They were afraid of the Armenians far more than they were of the other Christian communities. And uh, they never stopped uh, showing their real face. It was then uh, that uh, the persecutions started in the areas of uh, Adana and uh, Cilicia. And then all these persecutions uh, were expanded and came the 24th of April of 1915 when 150 intellectuals of the Armenian community in Istanbul were arrested and this was actually the beginning. Up until 1918, 1.5 million were those that uh, were slaughtered in different ways, 1.5 million people. These victims, and it was known back then, were slaughtered in pure sight. The Turks didn't take any measures to conceal, the, to conceal these slaughters. And not only that, 
Not only they didn't uh, apologize, but they were confessing it publicly. And there is the telegram of Talat Pasa to the prefect of uh, the Asia Minor, in which it was stated, let's get over with this uh, nation. We need to eliminate the Armenians. These are not my words. These were the words of Talat Pasha. And it is also known that a leading personality of that time, the ambassador of the American uh, of America, Marx Morgendau, had uh, clearly said, when I was talking with them, they were not denying that uh, their objective was uh, the annihilation of the Armenian people. They were confessing it, actually, even to the United States. And this brings me back to the never again. Back then, the West, and I'm leaving the United States aside because they were far, but the rest of the West are Europe, France, but especially Germany. They didn't know what was going on. Not only they did, but they were also warned by the people. And not only they didn't support the Armenians in their fight so that the crime could come to the surface, a crime that uh, was atrocious, but in Germany especially, ladies and gentlemen, where the nemesis came about later, and I'll explain to you how. In Germany, there was censorship imposed to the press that would dare speak about the genocide of the Armenians and about the other genocides. And in vain, the only one who actually acted differently was the leader of the Communist Party in Germany, Karl Lübeck who was uh, fiercely persecuted. Why? Because he used the medium of the Communist Party in order to reveal this uh, crime. So they knew, but not only they knew, but they imposed the silence to those who wanted to speak up. And this is actually what happened in the rest of Europe. Why? Because the circumstances were difficult. You understand that uh, back then it was a very difficult time for all people, and no one actually could learn what was going on uh, with the Armenians. And all the efforts were made in order to conceal the crime. And what happened? We reached 1939. Hitler has already started the operations in the context of the Holocaust of uh, the Jews, uh, the greatest crime that has ever been perpetrated against humanity, and not only of the 20th century, but of the entire history of mankind. So, then, someone told him, do you know what uh, you are starting? Do you know what will be the consequences? 1939, mind you. And so the famous reply of Hitler that was also published, what was it? <laughs> so what? Who remembers what happened with the genocide of the Armenians? These were the words of Hitler in 1939. What was Hitler confessing? Actually? that uh, he was willing to follow the steps uh, of the Turks. Why? Because he knew that uh, there was uh, the tolerance vis-a-vis uh, -vis this time of crimes. And keep these words. So we, the Greeks, and the Armenians, having experienced these uh, tragic uh, events, uh, we have decided to never forget, to never never allow oblivion uh, to prevail. And uh, we have learned something to convey these memories uh, to the present day, to make these simulations, I would say, simulations of history, because without these, when we are faced with events, uh, are like those pilots who, although know why, a plane may crash, uh, do not uh, abide by the standards of safety. So this is the same. Personally, I keep the memory of the genocide of the Armenians uh, close in my heart. Why? Because on the 5th of November in uh, 2019, at the end of my term, to visit Yerevan in Armenia as a guest of the President of the Armenian Republic, 
a charismatic man who back then offered a lot to Armenia, especially for the great cause, the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. And I'm telling you directly, Mr. Ambassador, we are by your side, but you, and I know what I'm saying, but you also, as people, you should not let this go. Don't accept uh, any compromises. Compromises start but never end. The struggles and the fights are those who may start and eventually end, but not compromises, especially when you have opponents uh, like uh, the leadership of Turkey, because everything I have told you, of course, uh, does not pertain to the Turkish people, but to the leadership of Turkey. The leadership is responsible. We, the Greeks, are not those who want to stand against these people, but uh, we want to stand opposite and against these leaderships uh, that uh, take advantage uh, of all uh, advantages and disadvantages of the Turkish people in order to reach their objectives. So back then I visited uh, Yerevan and it was a visit uh, that had uh, a meaning like today's event. And I said, some things that are similar to what I'm telling you today. The meaning was the same. Back then, I met uh, the President of the Armenian Republic, and uh, I will always keep the memory of this uh, meeting, but also I will always keep the memory of the visit of the monument of the victims of the Armenian genocide alive. If you haven't traveled to Yerevan, it's worth traveling and visiting this uh, high ground that is over the Hrazdan River and spend some time there. And look at the Ararat Mount, Ararat that expresses the tradition of all those people of the Christian world who have been captive in the Turkish uh, land just some miles from the borders of Armenia. Because you know, maybe you don't, but if you don't, it's worth learning, Ararat belongs to the territory of Turkey. But uh, when you reach Gizarkabert and uh, you look at Ararat, you understand that you can actually extend your hand and reach the Ark. But which Ark? The one which I believe uh, that we, regardless of the differences of our religions and of our doctrines, uh, to perceive as an arc of memory, because uh, the arc of Ararat uh, needs to survive forever. It hasn't been found, but we know that exists. It has to be an arc of memory that will allow us uh, not to renege on our promises. And I will also remember this uh, rose, this uh, rose which you live next to the monument where there is also the flame. And of course, I left uh, this uh, rose not as Prokopis Pavlopoulos, but as a representative of the Greek people. And I left this rose in order to express the soul of the Greek people and in order to show that next to the flame would always be by the side uh, of a uh, the Armenian people, and then it will always uh, keep uh, the memory of the victims alive, of all victims, not only of the Armenian victims, but also of the Greeks of Pontus and of Asia Minor. I have probably tired you, so I will conclude this uh, short speech. I said previously that it's uh, advisable to make some uh, historical simulations. So what are we told by this period? That the genocides uh, took place, uh, that the public opinion paid no attention, that the genocides actually left uh, Turkey unpunished. Turkey hasn't said uh, one apology up until to date. The genocides actually led to the creation of even uh, worse events taking, worse events, uh, and to the creation of worst uh, chimeras. And we must remember that. Why? Because even today, we can see these tragic events taking place. We can see wars taking place. We can see wars in which uh, the Turkish leadership uh, still has a very inactive role. We saw what uh, happened in Ukraine, something that continues uh, to take place even now. We saw the brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And I want to ask you, 
So, what about this attack, this invasion by Putin? Who was behind Turkey, it's a bit, the Kemalists of Turkey, through the invasion and occupation of Cyprus for the last 50 years. We are now 50 years after the occupation of Cyprus, and no one is talking about that. No one is talking about the potential punishment of Turkey. So why should Putin be worried about uh, invading Ukraine when he sees that Turkey has remained unpunished for 50 years? So wasn't Turkey the guide in this uh, crime that is perpetrated against the Ukrainian people? And, and what is the stance that we need to give? We don't want to take revenge. Because revenge, you can never get nemesis. Only through memory you can get nemesis. We are not obligated to say something. When the war in Ukraine is over, and when uh, the discussions about uh, retributions start, and uh, discussions about punishment start, what do we need to do as Greeks? What can we do in order to honor the never again? Aren't we obligated to say, of course, yes to sanctions? We have actually said yes to sanctions uh, from the very first moment. But sanctions against Turkey for the same crime? Won't there be any sanctions? So what's the point? If Turkey is not punished, how can we be sure that there won't be future Putins or future authoritative uh, rulers that will act the same? So we need to put into practice this never again. I know that I'm addressing to representatives of the Armenian people, and I know that they are like-minded, and uh, they share my views. That's why I told you previously, Mr. Ambassador, you should not give in to what... Uh, Others uh, tried to impose on you for the solution of the nagoro karabakh issue. The struggle for nagoro karabakh you will give and win with your soul. You need to know that. And you also need to know that uh, in this fight, you will have on your side all those people who respect uh, humans and democracy. And among those, of course, are the Greeks uh, that has its own civilization, its own uh, tragic events uh, in its history, tragic events that actually shaped its history. And once again, eternal the memory of those uh, victims uh, that we honor here today in the name of history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pavlopoulos, for your uh, speech. This uh, ovation, extended ovation, shows uh, the admiration towards him. What I will remember is that he has shown the emotions of Greeks, the Greek people, towards not only this atrocious crime of genocide, but also towards the Armenian people. Indeed, we do love these people, and I believe our emotions are neutral. These emotions are neutral. And I would like to give the floor to the last speaker. It is, he is a genocide scholar, and in particular, about the Armenian genocide. Professor Ara Ketivian. Sir, you have the floor. He will be talking to us uh, about uh, the Armenian genocide as it is referred in the uh, American press. Distinguished guests, uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this event, the Academy of Athens and uh, the Armenian Embassy to the Hellenic Republic. It's a very important event and um, for having given me the opportunity to talk about um, the evidence in the American newspapers. When the events were taking place in 1915, 
the First World War was taking place, the Arab revolt was on foot. However, the newspapers from Japan to New Zealand and Australia, Canada, and uh, the European countries were every day covering about the events. And I'm very often asked the question, why I have singled out the American newspapers. And there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, as you can see, there are 13 volumes. There should be 14. There's one missing. And it has taken me 20 years almost to complete the uh, 17 volumes. <clears throat> So the reason why I've chosen the American papers is um, is because the American uh, newspapers were in a much better position to report for the following reasons. One is the number of uh, newspapers published in the US. At the turn of the century in 1915 and 19, up to 1920, one half of the world's newspapers were published in the US. Believe it or not, someone has counted them, that wasn't me, but that is um, the figure given that one half of the world's newspapers, and we're talking about a, a few thousand. Every small hamlet, every small village in the US with a population of 500 to 1,000 supported a newspaper. There was this fascination uh, with newspapers uh, involving the Americans that goes far back up to the, uh, the founding fathers. The second advantage that uh, the U.S. had was the massive uh, missionary presence in the Ottoman Empire. By the time the 1915 events uh, commenced, the missionaries had been on the ground for almost a century. And these were um, a massive uh, enormous investment in schools and orphanages, but also the missionaries acted as the eyes and the ears of the American public. And uh, I will actually talk about the, the evidence in these newspapers came mostly from uh, the missionaries. The other reason is by the time the 1915 events happened, there had been already two major massacres before then. One is the 1895 massacres in the Eastern provinces, and the second one in 1909 in the Adana province, which spilled over later on to the uh, uh, Vilayet uh, or the province of Aleppo. So the American newspapers had a fairly good experience covering the events. Actually, the last volume, which is the second one on my left, was published last week. And it's about the Adana massacres. And I tried everything to present it in, in a book with less than 1,000 pages ended up with 800 because they, there was also some technical issues with the printers. Um, for some reason, they don't like big volumes, so I had to divide it in two, and then the cost would have been too high. So the Americans, the American press was the best one positioned to report on um, the events, and that's the reason why I chose the American and not the British. Another reason why I went for the American uh, press is because the Americans had 
um, a non-interference policy when it came to America dealing with the Ottoman Empire. Basically, uh, Americans said, we won't interfere in your internal affairs as long as you don't interfere in ours. And internal affairs for the Americans was the, the Mexico, uh, Cuba, and uh, Venezuela. And of course, they were busy in the Philippines, but uh, that didn't count. So uh, the next uh, thing I want to mention is people ask me, well, uh, they're newspapers. Uh, actually, a colleague of mine called me uh, last year. He's a professor in America. And he said, um, you know, Ara, you spend too much time on newspapers, but they're just newspapers. They say whatever they like. But I think there is a misunderstanding because it's not a case of saying what they like. All the evidence about the news reports is based on eyewitness accounts. And those were firstly the uh, diplomatic service. Uh, the Americans had <clears throat> a vast network of consular agents in the Ottoman Empire. Actually, some of the missionaries in remote areas were acting also as uh, consular agents and they were wearing two hats. One was that they were uh, religious. Uh, they were missionaries and the second one was that they were involved in diplomatic service. Uh, the, uh, the diplomatic service and then the missionaries, uh, the missionaries were uh, some of them were famous missionaries. They were families of missionaries who had been for generations on the ground. For example, the Naps, the Wheelers, uh, the Christies. These were big names, not only in the Ottoman Empire, but back home as well. These um, uh, generation after generation, they were they spoke the language perfectly. They spoke Turkish, they spoke Armenian, they spoke Greek. And they were, as I said, the ears and eyes of the American public. Uh, in many instances, the, when they uh, reported on events as eyewitnesses, the newspapers didn't reveal their names because um, they said uh, it's very sensitive. They didn't want to endanger the missionaries' lives. Uh, the same with the diplomatic agents. Um, you will see in the in the articles when in, when it comes to the name of the person or even the locality, there is a, a line crossed um, a line, a blank line without names. Uh, it was a precaution, and they actually declare in the article that because of the sensitivity of the issue, we can't mention the name of the person. Uh, the diplomatic uh, agents, uh, especially the consuls in the consul uh, in Beirut, was uh, a colorful, colorful figure, and there were constant skirmishes with Turks. Uh, in Beirut, and he had been shot at once. He was attacked. So uh, the consular uh, representatives were not immune from uh, attacks uh, and interference from um, the Turks and the locals. What there is in these books, you will find in archives. The same thing in the US State Department in the missionary archives and other places. I'll just give you an example. And this, this one refers, uh, relates to the, the Greeks. There was a big headline in August 1919 in the American newspapers that the Turks had killed 250,000 Greeks in the Pontus area. They actually mentioned uh, in between Ordu and Sinop, which is on the Black Sea coast. And they say 250,000 Greeks 
of all ages, from infant to old people, were killed without one single bullet being fired. There is the same article again in another newspaper that says uh, 250,000 uh, Greeks were killed and no blood was shed. So uh, what they did was that the Turks uh, pushed these Greeks in their hammams, the steam baths, in the middle of winter, took their clothes. It's reminiscent to what the Nazis did in the concentration camps. And the reason was given that it was a hygienic uh, procedure. And then they let them loose, stark naked, in the middle of winter, and they all died of pneumonia. And that's why uh, no blood was shed and no bullets were fired. This evidence came from a reverend Dr. Uh, White and uh, George Edward White. He was the president of uh, Anatolia College in Marsovan. So he wasn't uh, you know, just anyone or any uh, missionary. He was quite prominent. Actually, you can find the same evidence in the archives of the missionary head office. I also want to talk about uh, censorship in the Ottoman Empire. Censorship was a major issue. It was worse than in the Tsarist Russia. Censorship was on movement of people. Uh, people think that newspaper correspondents were running around in the uh, Turkish countryside, but that's not true. There were restrictions of movement. And also, uh, they were interfering even with diplomatic pouches. Uh, at one stage, uh, the American consul, Leslie Davis at Harput, was trying to send messages to uh, uh, Ambassador Morgenthau in uh, Constantinople, and the messages weren't getting through. He tried the normal postal service, and that, that didn't happen. And then he gave the message to a missionary, and the missionary hid the message in his shoe, concealed it in his shoe, and took it to the embassy in Constantinople. So uh, uh, censorship also was on, on books, newspapers, everything printed. If you were a tourist visiting the Ottoman Empire, they would usually confiscate the books if they contain certain words. If you, win, uh, if you wanted to send a telegram that contained certain words, um, that was not possible. For example, meeting, the word meeting or conference uh, was not acceptable. And uh, I just want to also mention the, uh, the secret messages and uh, the Turks always talk about the um, Tala Pasha, the interior minister's cipher documents, uh, telegrams that he was sending. He was basically telling the officials that when you kill the people, don't leave the bodies lying around. Don't burn them, don't throw them in uh, waterways and don't hide them in caves. That's what they were doing. But he said, just bury them. Of course, burying wasn't um, practical, so they kept doing what they knew best. Uh, another instance of censorship was they painted the, the windows of train carriages in white so that passengers couldn't see what was happening outside. So I want to finish my uh, description of the work by talking about the main purpose of this work. A lot of people ask me, why do you keep doing it? And basically, um, there is a good word in English which comes from ancient Greek, and that's mnemonics. It's keeping the memory alive. 
And it's for respect to the killed, and they also it's a respect, it's a sign of respect for the survivors who went through all that trauma and recovered and built their lives. But I also usually add another layer to this reasoning, and and, and people are surprised when I say this. If we don't keep the memory alive, um, we will be facing um, a security issue as, as nations, both Greece and Armenia, because if we have generations in the future who don't know the history well, they, they, are not, they will be equipped um, with basically nothing. They will lose their identity because they don't know their history well. And I want to finish also to, uh, by mentioning our um, neighbor country's president, Mr. Erdogan, made a, uh, in his customary fashion. He does this every year. Every year. He addresses, he sends a message to the Armenians and by proxy to the Greeks as well and the, the Assyrians and the Yazidis. And he, he tries to uh, find excuses, but he ends up with just saying nonsense and also being completely disrespectful and uh, insulting. So on the 23rd of April, he again sent his uh, annual message, which made big waves in the Armenian community around the world. I couldn't find the actual uh, uh, Turkish version. The reason being um, he was, in his customary fashion, talking to journalists, reporters on the plane coming back from Iraq. And I couldn't find the, the text, the Turkish text, but I've located this morning the English translation in, in the Turkish pro-government newspaper, Daily Sabah, and they're fiercely um, pro-government, so I'm assuming that the English translation is correct. So this is the message he, he sent to uh, the Armenians. A new order is being established in the region and it is time to set aside baseless claims. By baseless claims, he means the Armenian genocide. It is time to move forward with the realities on the ground. It is better than moving forward with fabrications and tales. So he calls, he calls all this uh, fabrication. So I wanted to return the favor this year and and ask Mr. Erdogan to at least spare five minutes to open any one of these books, any page, and just read the headlines, nothing else. I don't ask him to read uh, the full articles, just the headlines will do. I have a strong suspicion that uh, he, won't, he won't take me up on this offer because he knows the truth. Thank you very much. I would like to thank in my turn Mr. Ketibian for this uh, very beautiful and interesting speech. And I believe that all of us, uh, we should uh, keep the following. That it was not just the presentation of the genocide of the Armenians, but uh, the way that the Americans covered uh, this event, how it... Uh, was uh, represented in the American press. And we can see that the America actually had the empathy and the sensitization about this uh, event. And we need to accept that. We need to accept that maybe they are one step ahead uh, compared to Europe when it comes to issues like this. This uh, beautiful reaction on the, si on the part of uh, America. I don't know whether we can find something similar in uh, Europe. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Ketivian. And with this uh, speech, we came to the end of this event. But uh, as I already told you, you can uh, visit the exhibition in the 
eastern wing there you will have the possibility to admire the paintings of uh, Greek Armenians that have lived or still live in Greece. It will be worthy to visit this exhibition. Thank you very much.